what conversation on acid derivatives would not be complete unless we addressed our all too popular acid and base reaction. So we need to be familiar with the definitions for acids and bases. And because the last two videos, I didn't really have you do anything, we're actually gonna pop up with a quiz question right out of the gate. And so hopefully you were able to recognize or define our definitions for our acids and bases. So our acid would be a proton donor and our base would be a proton acceptor. The proton donor one is a fine definition, which isn't a big deal. Uh, I do want to address the, the base definition. Um, a lot of this definition of acid and base is really gonna come down to uh, <clears throat> qualifying what the reaction is doing. We're looking at an acid, it's very clearly giving up H, so we can reference that as a Bronsted-Lowry acid, or as we've been doing in this class, just call it an acid. Okay, so we see H+. But if we were to write an example for a proton acceptor, we might go to the standard hydroxide, but hydroxide, as we've seen in multiple occasions, can act as something other than a base. It could also act as a nucleophile. So when looking at our definitions, typically in second semester, while we are referencing the acid, we're also kind of being expected to look at bases and predict it how they function and react. So a potentially better or more useful definition for our base, if we're just looking at a structure, would be to look for an electron donor. This definition is problematic because nucleophiles are also electron donors. They're one and the same. Um, it's what they're donating the electrons to. Okay? So I just want you to be aware of that, that if you're being asked to rank base strengths, what you're looking for is an electron donor, not necessarily hydroxide. And we'll see how we would come up with that ranking in just a little bit, though you've already heard it because it's the same spiel I've been giving on this for a while now. So if we were to look at some examples, the two big categories that come out here are our carboxylic acids, clearly for our acids, and then uh, our bases usually come in with amines. If we're looking at that differentiation between our acids and bases, as we moved kind of rightwards on the pe uh, periodic table, whoops, Helps if I had my periodic table a little bit better memorized. If we connected hydrogen out to each of these. And then we move to nitrogen. And then we'd move to our carbon. And if we were to look at acidities, and really, I should switch that up. Our oxygen kind of comes in in the middle. It can act as both an acid and a base, depending on its local environment. The halogens will always act as the acid, and then nitrogen, because it's not quite straddling that line, ends up really just acting as a base. And that's largely due to the trail-off in our electronegativities. Um, all of those atoms are effectively the same size. Really, the only difference is electronegativity, and oxygen is that line. So we talked about carbon nucleophiles, 1,4 versus 1,2. Oxygen is that line for acidity, and it can either go acid or base, depending on the chemistry. Nitrogen has shifted just to the other side of that line and now exclusively acts as a base. It can still be forced to act as an acid, and that usually brings in some of the confusion with nitrogen's reactivity because people will try to make it act as an acid. And really, it's only going to act as a base. There's limited situations where it's going to act as an acid in the neutral state, okay? And we'll, we'll look at us at some of that confusion at the end of this slideshow. So what we need to be able to do is to look at a reaction and decide some information about it. And so if we're being asked to identify an acid-base reaction, you should be good at this at this point. Um, what we wanna know is was the only thing that changed a transfer of a hydrogen ion. So if we look at these two equations, uh, and we'll call them equation A and B, were they both just an acid-base reaction? Right, and hopefully what you can see is that in A, 
yes, there is indeed a transfer of a hydrogen. That hydrogen has moved from molecule to molecule. When we look at B, we're certainly seeing a transfer of a hydrogen as well. It's implied, which makes it a little bit harder. And this is where students will go, oh, well, that's an acid-base reaction. Eh, was the only thing that happened a transfer of a hydrogen ion. Note that we also lost the pi bond. So I would argue that this is not an acid-base reaction. This would be an addition reaction, and that addition reaction happens to have acid-base mechanisms. I know that kind of sucks because we're using acid base as both a reaction and as a mechanism, but we do. It's just the way it is. Kind of like zero. It's a placeholder and not a number or not one through nine. So this big summary thing probably should have stepped this a little bit slower. Okay. But can we evaluate our acid base strength? Okay, so a lot of what we look at when we're looking at acid and base strength, and I think that face is stupid, so let's just make that a little bit better, um, is that we're using the same basic rules that we used in the past. Oh, man, my numbering didn't quite work. Um, we're looking at charge, size, electronegativity, resonance, and induction. And it is those principles that we're applying to our definitions of acid and base. So we're using the same things that we've used the whole semester. All we're doing is changing our focus on how we would interpret it. So if we go through to look at an acid, general form acid, H plus plus A minus, right? If we look at that overall reaction, we might decide to look at our products as an easier way to interpret, okay? Why? What's different about the reactant versus the product? Well, the product has charge. We know charge is reactive, so let's look at the charges to help us understand something about the reactivity. Should we look at the H plus or the A minus? Well, if it's an acid, it's always gonna generate H plus, so it's not useful. So what we wanna do is keep our focus on the A minus. Before we even start evaluating out our rules, and that double four is bothering the heck out of me. Before we bother looking at those rules, what we want to do <clears throat> is consider what's going on with that A minus. What, what would make this a stronger or weaker acid? Right? And that statement right there already introduces an issue. We're addressing two things, stronger or weaker. Well, which do you want to do? Let's pick stronger. So if this is going to be a stronger acid than, say, this black one, what has to be true? Well, for A to be stronger, this A minus needs to be more stable than this one. Because if A minus is more stable, red A minus is more stable, it's going to form to a larger amount as more forms I increase the concentration of H+. Plus, right? So when we think to the definitions that we use for trying to rank acidities, all we're going through and doing is saying the stability of the conjugate base. Why? Well, we just walk through it. It's, it's easier to see stability for the conjugate base because it's charged. Right? So now we go through and we apply our definitions. If we were going to, again, compare after I just deleted it, red A versus black A, we would compare first charge. Were they both charged? Okay. What is that charge going to do to the stability of the overall structure? Okay. Well, if they're charged, that would make them less stable. Well, what did we say we wanted? We wanted more stable. So charge, the less charged it is, the stronger the acid. So what we're doing is placing the definition of acid and now just applying the rule set to look at. Let's say they're both charged. Well, in this case, they are. So the next thing we would do, do is move to size. Well, how is size going to affect stability? Well, the larger that atom is, the more space there is for the electrons to roam, and therefore the more stable it becomes. So bigger results in a stronger acid. 
Again, what we're doing is taking our rule and just applying the definition to it. That's it, okay? Electronegativity, resonance, all of that. So you're probably pretty comfortable with our acids, or at least you should be mostly comfortable with the acids. Where second semester, and particularly in the national testing, uh, appears and becomes more difficult is now ranking based off of base strength. And now, classically, students fail miserably. And the reason they're failing is they aren't applying charge, size, electronegativity, resonance, and induction to a definition. They memorized this. They just memorized this one section. Okay, And why does that become a problem? They're saying charge means stronger. Less charge is a stronger acid. What does that mean for the base? Okay, well, what does it mean to be a base? If I'm going to look at a base reaction, I have to accept hydrogen. And if I'm going to compare that base to say, again, let's just stick with it, a black base, how do I know which one is stronger? Okay. Initially, students will immediately jump on, well, I'm going to look at the conjugate acid. Fair enough. You can do that. Okay. But the base is a different animal to different species. If we go back to its definition, it must donate electrons. Well, organic chemistry is literally all about moving electrons. If I'm going to rank base strength, I don't have to look anywhere other than the reactant. There's no going across a reaction. I just look at the reactant and I just decide. Okay? A base needs to donate electrons. What's going to make it more active as a base? If it has more electrons. So I go to charge and I say, is it negatively charged? That's a stronger base. Okay? You're applying the definition to the sequence of rules. Okay? And it's that application that makes things change. What do I mean by change? Well, look charge, we wanted less charge and we had a stronger acid. And what happens when we move to a base? We want more charge. Oh my god, it's a new thing to memorize. No, it's the exact same thing. The exact same thing. You just have to apply that content, not memorize a whole bunch of stuff. Okay? That application, absolutely hands down, is challenging. Don't get me wrong. That is hard. Okay? But it's that application that minimizes the amount of stuff that you have to memorize, and it increases the odds that you will be able to apply that content to a foreign question on an exam. You will be able to apply that content to a future class, biochemistry. Right? If you don't have that application ability, all you're going to have to do is re-memorize all of the content, all of the content, all of the content, and that sucks. And that's why people have such a bad time in OCHEM, is all they're doing is memorizing. When we're looking at acid base strength. It's really not about memorization. It's about applying the pieces that you've got. Okay? So, we've got some examples here. Uh, I would like you to take a second to go ahead and just pause that video and work these out. Now that you're coming back because you've uh, spent some time looking at it, let's go ahead and take a look at the first one. Uh, and we could probably cheat and say, well, this first one is clearly the stronger acid. And for those of you being like, well, dang, how'd you do that so fast? It's not just because I know the answer. It's because I studied my functional groups. And this functional group is literally called a carboxylic acid. This one is called an amide. Which one is the stronger acid? Use your words, okay? Sometimes they help you out. If you didn't do the nomenclature studying on what those functional groups were, that's okay. Hopefully what you've done is now looked at our application behind these. If we're looking for acids, it can be helpful to look at the conjugate base, right? And we'll see that sometimes that isn't always the case in a little bit. I don't need to go through and show, and in fact, I shouldn't have drawn all of this out anyway, I don't need to go through and show, excuse me, I, I completely lost my train of thought. I have no idea what I, oh, the H plus. The H plus is unnecessary because they're both doing it, okay? 
And so now I could try and go through and, and decide which one of those was more stable. Well, I'd start with charge. When we look at charge, they're both negative. So there's no difference, not useful. Then I can move to size, okay? Before you nuance too much and look at, say, let's draw, you know, more rings out here. It's not the size of the molecule. It's the size of the atom, okay? The atom that is holding the charge, the atom that lost the hydrogen, nitrogen versus oxygen, they're in the same row. They are effectively the same, which means no difference, not useful. I can move to electronegativity, same or not same deal, nitrogen versus oxygen. We'd say oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. If oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen, what does that mean? It should stabilize the charge better, okay? If it stabilizes the charge better, then that one is more acidic because it's stabilized the charge better. Cool. You could see people push into resonance as an argument. It's irrelevant at this point because we've already established our difference at electronegativity. Okay? And again, there are cases where it doesn't work perfectly and you might need to drill down, but we don't need to. Okay? The next thing I do want to address on this one before we move on is that I will still see students sometimes saying, well, that nitrogen negative, uh, couldn't it be stabilized by resonance? Okay? And we just said, Resonance is, is an unnecessary argument, okay? But let's go ahead and push that argument just for argument's sake. Can I do resonance, okay? If we go through and try and do the resonance, we might say, well, yes, there's resonance to stabilize this. But, and here becomes the critical part, the lone pair that we started with was the one that was already involved in resonance. The lone pair that we have now, this red lone pair that came from that negative charge, the loss of the hydrogen, what happened to it? Nothing. Okay which means there is no resonance to stabilize that lone pair, okay? or at very least, very limited resonance. Okay? Why does that become important? Because if there isn't resonance to stabilize that, and the nitrogen is not electronegative enough to remove the hydrogens discussion earlier, okay? there's really no reason to remove a hydrogen. Yep, that's right. It's not acidic. And if we go through and look at the pKa's for the amide, we see that it's not very acidic. Okay, so be careful on when you're looking at resonance and structures. You can only do one lone pair of resonance at any given instance. Okay. Uh, so as we move on to the next one, okay, I'm going to say I didn't trust you because I'm a horrible person and I have trust issues, and you're going to answer a quiz question about it with the explanation for why one was more acidic than the other. Cool. Now we're back. We're going to move to the last one because I'm just going to trust that you got that last one or that second one figured out. And we will take a look at that last one and try and figure out what's going on with it. So some first glances. We have the acids located in the same space. Multiple choice exam. Look for things that are constant because those constants are probably where the chemistry is going to happen, but it's not the change you need to see. Right? It's not the difference. So the difference we're seeing here, which is where the question is really asking, is how does that nitro affect the reactivity of the acid? Okay. So we could go through and draw out conjugate bases. Unfortunately, the conjugate base is actually going to be a bit misleading. And one of the reasons it's misleading has to do with the cheat that was done here. If we draw this out, that's NO minus. Okay? We've got a positive charge out there in the oxygen. Okay? Um, we have to be careful 
that we understand what that nitro is doing to the overall reaction. Okay? And we really only see that if we bother to draw the Lewis structure. Okay? If we don't bother to draw the Lewis structure, what we've done is said that we are going to memorize the result. So a subtle change to the structure, and you're now dead in the water. Okay, so how could we go through and evaluate these? Well, if we start with charge, that's going to be that negative where we lost that hydrogen. I don't care about the nitro yet. Charge, size, electronegativity. All of those are going to be doing the same thing. We could then move to resonance. And we'll note that the resonance is also the same thing. Okay? We could also then move into an inductive effect. Okay? And we could say, well, let's take a look and see what that nitrogen. That nitrogen is closer in the red structure than it is in the black. Because it's closer, we might think that there's a stronger inductive effect for the red structure. Resonance is something that you should consider always. Okay? And the reason why I mention that is that how is that nitro affecting the structure? Okay? If we're looking at it as an inductive effect, you're saying electron density is withdrawn out of the structure or out of that ring. If we go through and draw out a bunch of Lewis structures for this, we can start to get a better feel, and I'm now going to just abbreviate that as, as NO2, for how that nitro is affecting stability within the structure. And forgive me for the silence here. We've got a lot of stuff to go through and draw. And we could do one more resonant structure. And for those of you being like, this is a lot of resonance, I don't want to have to draw all this. I hope we never have to. You probably won't have to for my sake for this unit. For the next unit, you will have to draw resonance. So you might as well start getting used to it. What happens in the other system? And this structure, for the record, is the important one that you want to be thinking about. Sorry, I'm kind of out of space there. Okay. So if we go through and compare... We're seeing that double bonded nitrogen. We've got a positive on a secondary carbon, positive on a secondary carbon. So those are effectively the same. Secondary carbon, secondary carbon. And now we can move to the kind of the last one. And you'll note that we're seeing that positive showing up inside a, a tertiary carbon. Okay? That's going to make that positive okay, slightly more stable as far as resonance. But the more important thing is how is that affecting the electrons out here? Because that positive charge is closer to the negative, those electrons are being sucked into the structure to stabilize that positive. Okay? And because the positive is now closer, we're seeing a stronger inductive effect via resonance than we are seeing based off of proximity. What does that mean? This structure is the critical one that says that that base is more stable. By making it more stable, we have said the para is more acidic. Okay. How subtle of a difference is this? Looked up the pKa's. I'm pretty sure this was 3.41 and 3.47. Holy mothers. Very subtle difference in acidity here. Right? But we can predict that by looking at those resonance. 
Note, sometimes our resonance requires us to dig deep to be able to find that difference. Other times, it's a little more apparent and obvious. Right? So take what you can from this. Recognize that it is a challenge to go through and build these. So let's move to the next one, which is a bit of a biochem jump. So if you've already taken biochem, you should actually be the expert here. Um, carboxylic acids, amines, and pH. Okay, so if we took a look at that individual structure and we bring in the idea of pH, okay, so let's say I'm at a pH of 2. Well, a pH of 2, we hopefully know, is acidic. So if I'm in an acidic environment, there's lots of H plus around. If I look at the structure that I've got drawn here, it could go between either that protonated state or the deprotonated state. If I'm at a pH of 2, what needs to happen? Okay. Well, I'm acidic, there's tons of H+, the deprotonated state doesn't exist, and my molecule looks like this. Okay. For organic chemistry, that's not a huge issue. Like We don't really care per se. We do take advantage of that when we're doing extractions, okay. but it doesn't really drive a lot of our everyday process. Okay? If we adjusted the pH to make it say a pH of, in this case, we could probably even jump to, uh, let's not do that, let's not do that yet. Let's jump to 12. Well, now we would say it is basic because we're in the basic environment. What we would expect is the deprotonated state to be the one winning out because we're in a basic environment. Okay? So pH can dictate our structure. And because it sounded like to me that there were some people that were missing some of this argument, how do we use that to our advantage in OCHEM? Well, if I'm at a pH of 12, this compound now becomes ionic. And an ionic compound is water soluble. The starting acid is typically water insoluble. Why does that become important? Well, if I have either an impurity or a target compound, that has a carboxylic acid functional group, I can play with the pH and cause that compound to move from water insoluble to water soluble and therefore, therefore purify and clean the environment. That's pretty awesome, okay? But really what we're talking about here is not a single functional group, we're talking about multiple functional groups. And in fact, we could bring in an amine and why this becomes important for, say, someone in biochemistry is literally what you are staring at right now is the backbone of all your muscles. We have an amine followed by an acid. This is literally an amino acid. And why is that relevant to biochemistry? Well, the goal in biochemistry is to study the things that make it up, like proteins and amino acids. To study them, we have to be able to separate, purify, remove them, uh, and kind of get them associated and free-flowing around. Okay? To be able to go through and do that, I have to be able to play with the pHs in their charge states. Why is that important? Well, if I look at this amino acid, and I want to now see what happens at a pH of 2. Well, the pH of 2, we already addressed the acid. We should protonate it. What should happen to the amine? Well, what are the protonated and deprotonated states for the amine? Okay. One object would be go, oh, well, it just stays protonated. It just stays like it is. Okay. The amine is a little bit tricky. Remember, its default is that it is basic. So if I'm at a pH of 2, this structure is actually false. And what I need to be drawing would be this. Why does that become important to me? That structure is now charged. It will interact with its environment differently than if it was uncharged. That could allow me to purify it through just extraction methods. It could also allow me to purify it through varying forms of chromatography okay, or gel electrophoresis. So playing with the pH changes those properties. Okay? You'll note that there is a little statement kind of down at the bottom, that references PKAs. And so far, I haven't really addressed the PKAs. Okay? We can do that. 
the PKA for a carboxylic acid, and for those of you about to freak out, hold your horses, for a carboxylic acid is about 4. If I'm at a pH of 2, that means I'm more acidic than the PKA. I need to keep it protonated. What is the PKA for the amine? Well, this is where I get kind of irritated with looking at stuff on the internet. Because when you look at the internet, they say the pKa for the amine is either a 9 or a 35. What? What is that in reference to? Okay, well, sometimes they'll say, well, no, 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 it's not for, it's, it's for the amine. So if you're going to tell me the pKa for that amine is a 9, what you are telling me is that I'm having it act as an acid. Oh, well, if, if, if that's what you're saying, the pKa for that, that's 35. Why do biochemists not care about that? They're in a water environment. We'll never see a pKa of 35. That reaction doesn't happen. But in the water environment at a pKa of 9, we will see. Well, what are they talking about then? If that's, but going this way, that means this is acting as a base, not as an acid. And that's the issue. That pKa of 9 isn't talking about the amine. It's talking about the ammonium going to the amine. That's the reaction that it's referencing when we're talking about a pKa of 9. Why does that become important to us? Again, we go back to our pH. If the pH is lower than the pKa, we are more acidic which then means the structure needs to have that hydrogen connected to it. What happens if I goose the pH? Okay, let's make the pH now uh, 5. What now happens to our structure? Well, the amine we said was a pKa of 9. The acid we said was a pKa of 4. How do I go through and evaluate this? Okay, well, if I go through, pKa lower than the pH, so pH is 5, pKa is 4, it's lower, then I need to remove the hydrogen. What does that mean? The pH is higher, so it is more basic than our functional group this functional group becomes negatively charged. Okay, What happens to the amine? Well, in the amine case, pKa is 9, pH is 5. The pKa, pKa is still higher than the pH, so I need to keep the hydrogen on. That's now the structure at that pH. It's now neutral. Okay. I can continue to tweak the pH, go up to, say, a, pK, a pH of 10. Now what happens? Now it's so basic. Whoops. Did we lose the nitrogen? No, just kidding. That we would lose that hydrogen, and we're now stuck with the neutral amine. Now we have a negative charge on our molecule. So an amino acid could shuffle between positive, neutral, and negative. Those changes in charges will change our overall end result, and that's kind of neat, okay? If it was just that, we'd be like, okay, I kind of get it, except if you remember or know much about biochemistry, there's 20 common amino acids, or 20 essential amino, let's just say 20 amino acids. If we drew in, say, tyrosine, what we're doing is modifying that carbon so it has a different substituent. And because we are organic chemists, we recognize that this functional group that I just drew, an OH connected to a phenyl ring, is known as a phenol, has a pKa of about 10. I now have another acid-base functional group in my amino acid, which means not only am I looking at the pH affecting the structure on both the amine and the acid. I'm also looking at it affecting the side chain, which then means everything becomes vastly more complicated. And you just be like, oh my gosh, this is crazy and nuts. Why would I ever do this to myself? Okay, And that's ultimately where students just memorize the crap out of it and hope for the best. Okay, But it, it 
gets worse because if you look at proteins, they don't say tyrosine, alanine, glycine. They go through and see TYR, GLY, and they use abbreviations because nobody likes the alphabet. Okay? Uh, and then we use abbreviations further and we get down to one letter codes. So in biochem, you could be seeing something, serine, uh, cysteine, alanine, tyr arginine, tyrosine, and you could be asked, what is the charge of that protein? And what you are expected to know is that S meant serine and the side chain was something. And C meant cysteine, and the side chain was a thiol. And R meant arginine, which meant you liked pirates. That was a joke, albeit a bad one. R, yeah, I burned it on the A. Good job, Mike. Tyrosine, we just looked at. And so what you would be expected to know is the pKa's for each of the side chains, the pKa for the amine, the pKa for the acid, and being able to interpret very swiftly the pH relative to those to be able to determine the charge on the protein. Again, why is that important? That allows us to purify and separate proteins. Really, really cool, okay? Um, but it all falls back on being able to interpret pKa's, what that means to structure, and then applying it all again and again and again and again. Okay, so it is a bit of a challenge. It is also kind of fun. I'll ask simple, maybe single amino acid questions. I'm not going to ask the full protein, and I certainly wouldn't do it based off of the name of the amino acids. I'll give you structures. Okay, uh, with that, we are done because I already talked way longer than I wanted to do. Uh, so I'll say thank you for listening and dealing with that. Have a good rest of your day. Awkward silence while I try and stop. <laughs>